Thank you. Okay, so my name is Stuart Noyce, and I am a product manager. I have been for a while, but before that I was a computer science guy, so I, I knew how to code. Um, recently, the last year, I spent uh, learning how to write JavaScript. I wrote a full stack JavaScript application, so it's have uh, some code running in, in Heroku right now. And uh, I'm looking at visualizations as a way of presenting the data that's in that and, and the data that's accumulating in that app. And when I, I, I been, this is my fifth uh, visualization that I've written with D3. And I asked Ian, I said, I, I'm looking forward to coming in and putting something up on the screen for you guys today. And, he, and I asked him what to do, and he said, well, why don't you look at the D3 list, which is what he just showed you. So I took that same list that he just showed you, and I downloaded it in uh, CSV, and I started to crunch it like a good product manager does. And I don't look at, the, you know, I, I was listening to, to Sarah, it was a great talk. Um, I don't look at it from a design perspective because I'm a business guy, so I'm looking at it from a perspective of what can I learn from this data, and what could it tell me about um, business opportunities that are around D3. And right now, I don't know if there are a lot of business opportunities. It's an open source kind of thing, but it's fun. And there are a lot of people building on top of it, and I think yeah, there probably will be some opportunities to come. Okay, so the first thing I saw when I looked at this was I downloaded the information, the title and the URL, completely full. You know, that's pretty obvious, and the thumbnails are almost all full. So that's, that, all that data is good. But the authors, <clears throat> we're, miss we're missing a bunch of authors in here. Probably um, we only had maybe 60% of the authors were covered, uh, were listed. And on types, it was even less. Um, so very few of the types were included. So I looked at it and said, well, <clears throat> let me focus on the authors first. And I started you know, pasting data in. And uh, that's when I first started. That's when the, the inspiration kicked in. Because I started to see that <clears throat> when the code that I was writing, excuse me, <clears throat> um, to, try to, uh, you know, to try to discover the, uh, the name of the person from, say, the blocks. You know, a lot of people have their, their blocks, have their name in the blocks. And you can pull that name. Um, a lot of people have their name maybe in their domain uh, or in you know, some other part maybe that's, that's after the first slash of the domain. So there are ways to pull this, some of the data in. So I got it up to about 90%, and then I started to do the, to the numbers. But what it showed me was, what the really cool thing was, is that this information here, can I pull this in? I'm pinching it. All right, well, that's, that's brilliant. So you can see a little bit more of this. Um, but basically what I'm showing here is, is I said, let me take all the authors and then show them by where they are showing their work in a domain. And that was the interesting thing. The interesting pivot on this was where are the authors showing their work in the domain. And here you can see it's a very long tail distribution here, right? Mike Bostock ru rules this world. This is his world. <laughs> we all are showing up in it. Um, in on the, the, the area where he spends a lot of his time, which is, you know, which is blocks.org, um, you see there are 880. When I pulled it down, there are 880 um, you know, apps running on, on blocks.org. Compared to the rest of this, you know, that's out of 1900. So there, that's a pretty dominant position. But look at how many people are actually just doing one or two, right? So he's done almost 700. But everybody else has done one or two. We're the noobs, OK? We're the noobs, right? And even here, there are a lot of people doing two, three, or four, and we're the noobs. I think the interesting thing about this data from a product manager's perspective is there actually is right in here. And can I pull, push this up a little bit? How do I get this up to go up? So on the side here. Uh, two, three, three sides, Bob. Uh, right there. Just on. There we go. That's what I wanted to show you, just on the bottom there. OK, so this group right here, OK, so the, this is. Mike's, um, that's his GitHub. So uh, GitHub is actually a big place where a lot of people are showing up, almost 200 visualizations on GitHub with Mike leading the way there. But what I thought was this was interesting. Jason Davies, 71 visualizations on his own website. So John Kiernander, this is um, uh, Dimple's, Dimple.js, Dimple.js. He's building business applications, business analysis applications on D3. That's interesting. Um, this is Tributary. Let's give a <laughs> shout out to Ian. Yeah. Tributary. And the New York Times, which is the, the, uh, the source of many collaborations. 
And then down here, we, see, we, we, we keep going through. This is Jerome. Jerome's here. Jerome here. And, uh, and there's Mike again on his own boss next door. So you can see as we go around here, there are quite a few sections here where there are actually quite a few people. Even Blogspot has 16 visualizations on here. So what you're seeing from this is there's a, a pretty interesting middle class that's showing up here in the long tail. So from a, from a business guy's perspective, I think this is a great place to be. And I, this again, this is my fifth visualization. I've done the Rheingold tree and the um, indented tree. They, you know, it, it's just so many fun things you can do with this. And um, I hope that you guys all enjoy doing it yourself. Take care. So this is sort of a last minute presentation for me, but um, <laughs> I'm actually out here visiting from uh, Brooklyn, New York. And I just saw that Ian was doing this and told him I wanted to share a project that I've been working on for the last year. Um, this is my first D3 project. Um, before that, I was mostly using processing um, to prototype and design uh, information graphics. Um, so this project is about the last 40 years of uh, global refugees. Um, and we got the data from the UNHCR. And together with Hyperact, <coughs> which is a, a design studio in Brooklyn that does social driven design projects, uh, we designed and developed this project. Um, I was going to show a lot of the process images from the prototypes that I developed in processing, but I see this is a very D3 focused group. Raise your hand if you've used processing before. Cool, well this was sort of my uh, gateway into D3 and now I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll get into that later though. Um, so as soon as you go into the web page, it sort of um, plays a timeline, uh, starting from 1975 to 2012. Um, so we, I'll just go ahead and let that play. Up here, you see the amount of total refugees for the world. You see the world population. You see the uh, refugees to population ratio. And then you see um, just how many origin countries are here, and also the top five origin countries as far as the uh, volume of refugees. Um, so you, as time goes on, you can begin to see different patterns. Um, but a couple of things. This isn't the first time uh, this data set was visualized. Um, but there were versions that were not inter interactive, like this one that um, Guardian published. Um, there were some older ones that were done by students that weren't updated since like 2008. So we wanted to take a look back at the data and make it uh, more accessible and beautiful and well, sort of more modern um, and something that would work on uh, mobile devices. At the moment, it doesn't, but it will by the end of the week. Um, so I'll just go through some of the interactions. So you can stop the timeline at any time and just go, oh, all right. So. These little icons you see, these are um, countries that we wrote stories for. So when I first prototyped it, we were looking at the data from different perspectives. Um, one being that you could look at it from the perspective of an origin country and look at where all the refugees went, like look at the asylum countries that they settled in. Or you could look at it from the different countries and see which um, asylum country that everyone went to. So there was two directions. Um, we chose to concentrate on the stories of like why people left the country. Um, we found a lot more interesting stories about that. And also, we wanted to make the uh, visualization more people-centered. So we took you know, the hundreds of uh, megabytes of quantitative data and wrote over 80 qualitative stories about it. So each of these icons you see is actually for that year um, as a story about the country and why the refugees may have left. So you can navigate it sort of in this country view and go back into the years. We'll skip to 1995. 
where there's another story um, about Mali and a peace agreement with, Rebel, with rebels. Um, I'll just zoom back out. And also the other view, as far as the world view, is looking at it in a population to refugee percentage. So you can see, um, based on the density of the population there, uh, in relation to refugees, how the sizes of the circles change. Um, that's pretty much it. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to take some questions, see what people are interested in as far as like how I use D3 in this project. But it's my first project, so let's go too crazy. Yeah. How long did it take you to do the whole project and what, what were you doing it by yourself? Uh, no, so I did it with Hyperact. They're like, um, I worked with a team of uh, four people there. And it took about a year of like nights and weekends and just in between projects to do it. Yeah, it's an independent project in partnership with them, so, yeah. So, oh. oh, you said that you can click on the little icons to see like where they went to. Um, mm -hmm. Can you focus, because you have top origin countries, and it seems a little bit, a little bit cut off, but can you... Um, yeah, let me just go... Um, can you filter by here. that, or...? Go up to view. Go all the way up to the to okay. bar. There you go. To view. Nope. Well, you click view and then top view on the yeah. Oh, okay. And then enter for the visual. <laughs> Alright, cool. Thanks. Um what was your question? Oh can we just filter out the top five? Yeah, yeah can you interact with the countries or um so or basically you can just to? look at the larger circles and <laughs> navigate through those. Um and then get that information that way. But the icons are the stories with the with the headlines. So beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, just to geek out on the gradients you put in the lines. Do you want to tell people how you do? Oh that? yeah, that's yeah. So awesome. <laughs> that's that's smart. Um, so the gradients actually, um, it's an effect where. It starts from red and it goes to white to show the direction of um, the direction of flow of refugees. So it goes from red at the origin to white at the uh, asylum country. Um, yeah, that's that. At first, actually, we designed it so that the um, they were radiating from the shape of the country itself. But then it got a little difficult when you got to smaller countries and it was like sort of obscuring the data. So we ended up using circles and it worked great. Um, yeah, any other questions? Um, what was the stack you used in the front? Is it just plain D3 or did you use some like backbone to structure? Yeah, no. Stack plain it's just straight D3. It's very easy. Yeah. I tried backbone, but then I was like, I'm not designing anymore, so. <laughs> it worked in it worked in just the D three. I was gonna try that actually for the um, the history API, um, but then I just I used uh, push state. Did you find that the did you did you make a design first for this? And I was also wondering if the design changed because you it's your first project like you said. And yeah. Did something change because you found that found that there's something working for you that led. Yeah, the design changed multiple times. Um, I found myself designing a lot more in D3 because in processing there's no scene graph. So I was able to, with this, uh, use SVG, which has a scene graph, and I could style it with CSS. I could animate it with CSS. So I didn't feel like I was like having to think too much about code because it was a lot easier compared to um, processing as far as like animating objects and interacting with them too. You've got all these stories, right? But you can't really see the icons till you, I mean, maybe you could do something with zoom in or, or somewhere you could see all the qualitative stories. Uh, you can. Like you got some neat content that. Uh, well, what do you mean? Okay. Could, um, you, you can see them, I just had something selected. So okay. when you highlight something, all the icons fade out so you can focus on them whatever you highlighted, and then when you select it, 
they also fade out, so you can focus on the, the information. Yeah, but you can zoom in actually. Um, I didn't want to put zoom in buttons on here just because there's really only two levels. So if you wanted to zoom in, you could just um, use the mouse wheel. But I mean, it, it wasn't really a map where there was that high resolution of data where you'd need to zoom into different levels. It was either the, the country level or the world level. So I didn't really think that we needed a zoom out zoom button. Uh, so how much data did you say you, you had for this? Uh, it was like a, well, it, it was like a 100 megabyte text file, which I distilled into like maybe 10 megabytes. Uh, and how are you loading? Are, are you just loading that in one big block? Or? Yeah, um, and there's some behind the scenes stuff that's happening also. Uh, this is hosted on GitHub, and I think they do a lot of compression on the server side because when you look at it at uh, the developer tools, it's minimized a lot more. So I think at the end, I think it's about five megabytes that you downloaded. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you said that you're going to make a mobile version of this, or you're working on a mobile version? Yeah, it should be out um, by Friday. Okay. If not what are soon. the challenges that you've come across in trying to make a mobile version of this? Uh, well, I really wanted at least the iPad version to be as interactive as this is. But we ended up just using um, sort of like a static interface that focuses more on the stories and less on the quantitative uh, data about the refugees. It's just like one story after another after another, and you can just sort of navigate. Um, there's also a smaller scale map for each year with the circle, but it's sort of uh, you know less effective to interact with um, you know the bubbles on a mobile phone. It's just you know too low res. Uh, no, because we're just uh, we just made everything into a PNG, so you're literally just swiping okay. one image after another. It's not dynamic. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Do you, do you have thoughts about are you are you going to continue to work on it? Are there are there next iterations in your mind about what this project is, or is this? Uh, yeah. Well. We, we thought, well, there could be a second version where, where we try and tell the story in the opposite direction. Uh, as, like, for why, why the, uh, say, like, a lot of people, like, went to the U.S., like, why is uh, the U.S. a country that a lot of people found asylum in and tell it from that direction? Um, uh, other than that, um, I, I prototyped some sort of, like, flow charts to tell the story without a map. Um, so that could be another direction. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, maybe in a, another presentation I'll go and show all the prototypes, but okay, not now. But yeah, if anyone's in New York in the next two weeks, I'll be uh, presenting this project in more, in more detail, like visualized, so. Um, and yeah, the, the website's therefugeeproject.org. Um, you can find me on Twitter here. No, oh, all right, that's my website. It's a non-website though, but you can find me on Twitter here. That's me. Yeah, that's it. All right, awesome. One thing I loved that the last speaker said, and this was one thing that always killed me. Uh, introduction to D3 when I was starting to learn it. Everything they show you, you're doing, you're doing all your styling through JavaScript. Uh, barely any mentions of CSS. SVG can be styled. A lot of it can be styled uh, uh, from CSS. An important part about this is that you can actually. Um, everybody uh, uh, practices responsive layouts, right? You don't want two sites. You don't want a mobile site and and a desktop site. So, uh, does anyone know what the uh, preserve aspect ratio attribute is? So, uh, SVG will scale down um, very frequently. This works very nicely. Uh, text is where it starts getting a little bit funky. Um, but you can use media, CSS media queries along with scaling down your SVGs. And 
legibility was my big problem initially. And you can see from this chart then, as we, as my whole thing scales, uh, the legibility would have gone down, but then I'm actually bumping up my font sizes as I go. It's not displaying very well on there, but it does work. Uh, and uh, UCSS to Salier SVG is the moral of the story. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Ray, and I just want to say, first of all, thanks to Victor. This is inspired by his talk at the AngularJS meetup. So I, I made a little thing that integrates AngularJS with D3, and so one of my first words into um, D3, so ho hope you guys like it. So the way this is, um, it's a Bitcoin arbitrage opportunity watcher. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, so what, what it's doing is it's uh, fetching data from from the uh, REST APIs from the different exchanges, except Mongox, which is connected to the socket I/O. Uh, and on the bottom, we have a D3 chart, and as you can see, the um, it, it looks a little funny. It's mainly because of the um, scaling issues. So. Uh, so back to what the previous speaker was saying. That's why you use percentage. Um, heights instead of uh, fixed heights because if you use fixed heights you end up with something like this <laughs> So I always use percentage heights, um, but the, the idea is um, You have the different exchanges on top here are the prices uh, the update per the rate limits of the API and then you can set whichever um, Exchange you're trading on and then you calculate the uh, opportunity based on the price differences um, the fees, um, the slipperage, uh, and the time differences between when, when you trade and the currency exchange differences. And they will tell you that if you're trading, say, on BTC, it will tell you that the best opportunity is back to Mongox. And that's pretty much it. There's a minor tip. Uh, the text is getting selected when you hover over it. Yeah. There's a CSS property called pointer events. If you set it to none, your mouse won't interact with the text, and it'll just go uh, through. So it's like a little known thing you find right, in, right. you know, after three months on the mailing list. And cool. Thanks. All right. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, really enjoyed having you out here tonight. Thanks again to Yelp. Thanks to all the speakers. Have a good night. <laughs>